Okay, so talking about specific conditions when it comes to the ear. Uh, so bites and lacerations. Mostly our um, task at hand is to control the bleeding and then prevent that, that, uh, that wound from getting infected. Um, we also would like to make sure it doesn't start bleeding again. So one thing we might need to do is a head bandage. So I have a picture of a dog here with a head bandage keeping that ear packed down so that, uh, so that it doesn't keep re-bleeding. Um, so these guys, like ear wounds tend to bleed quite a bit. Um, if possible, we may need to do some surgery to close up that wound or we need to cauterize and stop the wound from bleeding. We could use tissue glue for that. We could use a cautery agent. Um, this, like a cut like this, that's gonna, that, that's gonna be like that. Once it heals, it'll, it's not gonna heal up and close, something like that. That's probably gonna leave a scar, right? It's, so you, you're gonna end up with deformed ear there. Uh, usually we're gonna send an animal home with antibiotics and a pain relief, so NSAIDs going home after something like this. And then, like I said, we may need to uh, bandage the ear to prevent it from keep re-bleeding or opening up again. So wounds like that can be caused by lots of things. Um, usually it's going to be some kind of fight or bite. So allergic otitis. So this is a very allergic ear. Look how red that is. If we touch that, it would feel really hot. And this is going to be really itchy for this dog. Uh, so they probably have some kind of food or inhalant allergy or a bit of both. Um, so how we can treat that, we can bring down that initial swelling with antihistamines and steroids. Um, and then we're going to want to find out what the animal's allergic to and get them onto a diet that is helping them with that. So it is possible for these allergic to ears to become infected. It's a secondary infection. So the primary problem is the allergies. The secondary infection is the bacteria taking advantage of the skin being so red and raw and then growing and becoming an infection there. Uh, so if it is infected as well, we're also going to need to treat the infection. If it is allergic ears, it's usually going to be bilateral, which means both ears are going to be affected that way. So an oral hematoma, that is a broken blood vessel inside the ear um, that leads to uh, the ear filling up with blood in between the skin and the cartilage. So what we need to do for these surgeries is drain that ear um, and then we're going to stitch down the, um, the skin of the pinna to the cartilage to help it heal. So I posted a video, you should really watch the video, it's really interesting how they treat it. Um, it says here usually unilateral. I have seen bilateral oral hematomas though, that poor dog. It's not, it's not fun for pets when they do get both ears like that. So humans can get oral hematomas as well, just in, incidentally. Um, perhaps you've heard of like boxers, um, you know, like, like people that box, that fight, um, where they have cauliflower ears. Cauliflower ears are healed oral hematomas. So the, the skin does usually tend to get kind of, um, it heals really scarred and so it looks really bumpy and off. So uh, frostbite, the ears is a really common sight for frostbite to happen, especially up here in Canada. Uh, it's so cold um, and animals that are left outside in the winter can get frostbite on their ear tips. That will kill the skin and eventually um, that skin will die and then fall off, right? So it becomes necrotic. It turns black and then eventually falls off. I don't know if you have, I don't know, in Manitoba, um, in shelters, cats that have their ears frozen off um, are sometimes kind of like lovingly, jokingly called Manitoba folds. So you guys have heard of Scottish fold cats, I'm sure, where they have like their ears, um, they're kind of folded down and that's like a normal part of their breed description. Um, but Manitoba folds are cats that have had their ears um, damaged by frostbite. So I don't know if you guys have that kind of joke in Alberta, but uh, we have that here. It's kind of sad for the, for the cats. Uh, so, uh, sorry, if, a, if an animal does have frostbite, um, we can try to um, hopefully warm it up and treat it. Um, but um, 
often uh, this the damage is already done so it's, it's a little bit uh, it's it's a little bit tricky but the the skin will die and fall off and then the animal can continue to live a great life so otitis externa uh, you'll honestly probably see at least one of these a day it seems like there's so many ear infections very common in animal medicine so what happens there is the external ear canal gets really inflamed we talked about dogs that are predisposed. So dogs with narrow ear canals, dogs with down ears as opposed to up ears. So a down ear dog would be like, yeah, like a, a golden retriever versus like an up ear dog, like a, like a German shepherd, let's say. Uh, dogs that swim tend to get water in their ears. Dogs with allergies, the ears, the, our bacteria in the ears tends to just take advantage of those red skin and try to grow their um, dogs with really hairy ear canals because the hair will trap moisture in the ear. Um, dogs with seborrhea, which is like a skin condition. Um, yeah, there's lots of things that can that can really predispose animals to those ear infections. So uh, otitis could be because of a wax buildup. It could be bacterial. It could be yeast. It could be iatrogenic, which means caused by either the owner or the veterinarian. Um, sometimes you can develop otitis with like way too much cleaning or plucking of the hairs or using really harsh cleaners or ointments because the ears will react to them and then the bacteria that's normal in the skin uh, takes advantage and just gets out of control. So typically to treat uh, our first step is that we are going to collect a sample for cytology or culture and sensitivity. The doctor is going to examine the ear to make sure that the eardrum is, um, is intact. And then we're gonna clean the ears to remove as much debris as we can. And then we will usually send them home with a, with a topical medication. So like I said, very, very common. These can be in one ear or both ears. When we talked about those um, otoscopes, right, and the oto otoscope tips, we need to make sure that we, have, we either clean the tip in between or use a fresh one in between. Because if it is a unilateral ear infection and you check the infected ear first and then look at the uninfected ear, you can transfer that infection from the infected to the uninfected. So we want to use uh, different ear tips in between or clean and disinfect them in between each ear. Uh, so the certain breeds, you can you read for more um, information on there, which we already kind of talked about. And then of course, uh, the treatments, which we just talked about too. So ear mites, here's an example of that coffee grounds discharge. It's kind of really dry and crumbly. So ear mites are more common in cats than dogs. They're also fairly common in ferrets. It seems like I see a lot of mites in ferrets. Um, they can happen in rabbits too. It tends to be a different species uh, in rabbits than um, like the cat ear mite. Uh, so whenever they have ear mites, it's usually gonna be bilateral. Um, if one cat in a household has it, probably all the cats in a household have, have it. So, um, you know, they all should be checked. So what we're gonna do is clean out those ears. I personally like to flush out an ear mite ear because uh, the debris is so crumbly, it just like washes out really nice with water. And then you try to get out as much as you possibly can. So try to get all the eggs, try to get all the bugs, try to get all the debris. And then we can treat with, um, with some kind of antiparasitic. So a miticide is gonna kill mites. Um, Revolution, I, uh, my doctors that I've worked with all love Revolution for ear mites. Revolution is a topical applied drug that um, gets into the bloodstream so it is systemic so uh, how it works is you it's just like comes in a little tube you pour the contents of that tube onto the animal's skin on the back in between the shoulder blades it absorbs into the body within two hours and it makes basically it makes the blood toxic to mites so when they because they're 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 blood feeders they bite the ear and um and eat the blood that blood is now toxic to them, they die. So Revolution's a great product for that. So there's a little ear mite. Uh, incidentally, ear mites are not um, zoonotic, so owners aren't going to catch ear mites from their cats. 
But just a interesting story. There was a British veterinarian who wanted to conduct a study about ear mites and whether or not they could take hold in a, a human and establish an, an infestation or infection. Um, and so he placed ear mites into his ear on purpose. And, uh, and so you will have like a transient infection if you do put ear mites into your ear, but they're not gonna really establish the way they would in a cat because we aren't the ideal host. But one of his observations was that you can hear the ear mites walking around and chewing in your ear. Oh, it just sounds disgusting to me. So I like to share that one and gross everyone out. <laughs> So foreign bodies in the ear, that long bent ear canal can often make it hard to remove things. One thing that can be a foreign body is people using Q-tips in their dog's ears. When I instruct owners how to clean ears at home, I always tell them do not use Q-tips. Uh, it's fairly easy for them, especially in a really big ear canal to get lost in there and we don't want that. So we can also see foreign body things like grasses or debris or twigs. Um, if the animal isn't very cooperative or is in pain, we're probably going to need to sedate or anesthetize them to remove that. Um, and if it's a nice small thing, we're probably going to use, um, like maybe like an alligator forcep to remove these. They basically have like a long kind of stick and then just like a little grabby, uh, kind of like pinch pinch thing at the end that can pick up the foreign body and remove it. If the foreign body's been there for a while, they could also have a secondary infection. So something to look for as well. So tumors in the ear are often going to be fairly deep in the ear canal, uh, which makes them really tricky to remove. Um, <clears throat> so if that does happen, um, typically, honestly, that's probably not gonna be treated in your typical hospital. That's gonna be something you're gonna refer out to um, probably like a board certified surgery specialist. So otitis media, that's infection of the middle ear. That includes the eardrum and then all those little bones uh, inside that middle ear there. Um, it could also come up from the eustachian tube as well following a throat infection. So uh, otitis media can cause the eardrum to either bulge or rupture. They're probably gonna have a head tilt, it's gonna be very painful. And there's facial nerves running through that area um, that may uh, end up paralyzed and you could see deafness as well. So <clears throat> you might see this with or without an external ear, com in ear infection. You might see it with a throat infection uh, or a respiratory infection as well. Um, this is a more serious uh, infection than otitis externa. Externa is fairly easy to treat. You just put in some topical eardrops, right? But in this case, especially if that eardrum is ruptured, it's going to be really tricky to clean that area. We can't, um, we can't use things like ear cleaner. Um, we can only really use saline to clean. Um, and it takes a long time to heal. So three to five weeks, they're gonna be on meds for about six weeks and they could possibly have uh, permanent hearing loss or changes to the ear as well. Um, so that one's not great. It's, uh, you definitely don't wanna tr like try for a middle ear infection. <laughs> oh my goodness. I just zoomed in here, I'm trying to zoom out again. Oh my goodness, this is such a sensitive zoom. And when we talk about the, oh my goodness, otitis. <laughs> this is really not going well for me. This is like, a, I'm being pranked. When we're talking about otitis media, um, or sorry, not media, was it media? Yeah, media didn't sound right to me. Um, we're talking probably we're not going to really use uh, topicals as much. The systemic drugs are going to be a little bit more helpful in there. <clears throat> so otitis interna. So that is the inner ear infection. Um, and that can cause um, dizziness. So we might see um, an issue with 
um, and the animal having like vertigo. Vertigo is the word for dizziness. So there's a little diagram here of the inner, middle, and outer ears. So you can wrap your head around which is which. So if the animal has this oh, sorry, vestibular syndrome, um, then they seem like they're really dizzy. They have that lack of coordination. They might have a head tilt. They might be like falling over. Uh, it can be a little bit um, uncomfortable for them. So we may be able to treat something like that with antibiotics, but sometimes there's uh, ongoing nerve problems and uh, may even need some surgery as well. So, <coughs> so deafness can be congenital. That means they're born with it. <coughs> and it's often associated with coat color. So maybe you've heard before that white cats or white dogs are more likely to be deaf. Also merle dogs. So maybe you've heard of those blue merles, like Australian shepherds, a lot of those are merles. Uh, so what, what's happening there is that there's, they don't really have a lot of melanin, which gives the um, pigment to hair and skin. And then that means that the, co the cochlea, which is part of the ear involved with hearing, um, also doesn't have that melanin. And so uh, there's, there's issues there in the ear. So I did post to you an article about um, congenital deafness and how that is passed along in cats. It's a really, I think, really interesting article. So I would give that one a read. Uh, I posted that with the ear stuff as well. So it's easier to diagnose bilateral deafness than unilateral because um, if they're not, if it's bilateral, they can't hear at all. And you can probably readily see that with the animal, but unilateral, we can't tell because they're probably still gonna react to those sounds. So we can use that Bayer test to um, test for that as well. That's not something we can do in just the regular, oh, here's an example of a Merle dog. Uh, that's not the Bayer test isn't something we do in just your regular hospital. It's something that's going to have to be um, uh, referred out. So idiopathic vestibular syndrome. Um, lots of times when animals get this, uh, people think that they're um, like having a stroke. So that's um, oh sorry no that's not this one sorry. Um, anyways, idiopathic vestibular syndrome. That's um, oh yeah no this is the one where it looks like a stroke. I was thinking I had it mixed up. Um, but anyways, um, often people will think that their dog is like stroking out with this. So it's not that the, a stroke is like a blood clot in the brain. Um, that's not what's happening here. Uh, it's some kind of damage to the inner ear. Idiopathic means we don't know what caused it. So what happens here, we're going to see um, that head tilt. They might be circling to one side. They might be throwing up because they're incredibly dizzy because of this inner ear damage. Um, but often even without treatment at all, they will recover and seem fine. So that's kind of interesting. But yeah, lots of owners think because they, they're all of a sudden their animals acting really strange and they think that they're having a stroke, but dogs typically don't have strokes. Um, and I think that's it. That is all the specific conditions that we wanted to speak about. Okay, so if you do have any questions about any of these ear illnesses or the uh, signs, the clinical signs or the treatment options or diagnostic options, please do make sure you ask those questions. So you can, um, I'm just like looking for a good picture to end on here. I was looking for that inner ear one. I think I scrolled past it though. Um, there we go, that's where I wanted to end. So make sure you do ask me those questions. So I'm available in the virtual classroom, in the chat, or you can send me an email as well. So hopefully this video lecture was a little bit helpful to you. And um, I really do encourage you to watch those videos and read those articles I posted about ear conditions as well. I think those are all great resources that really help you to understand some of the things that we're talking about here. So thank you so much for watching the video. Do please make note of any questions that you have so that we, we can get them answered for you. Thank you.